Hi, my name is Emma Myers. I'm the program manager at Reef. Since President Biden was inaugurated almost a month ago, we've heard a lot in the news about immigration reform. And so these are our key takeaways about the things that are most going to impact asylum seekers in New York City who are going through the affirmative process. I'm going to talk first about things that have already been done. Second, I'll talk about things that haven't been done yet, but could be done quickly. And third, I'm going to talk about things that haven't been done yet, but would take more time to do. Before I begin, I want to offer a couple uh, words of caution. First, I'm going to talk about a lot of proposals that haven't yet been implemented. And um, many of the, you know, these could still not be implemented. Uh, the president, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, or Congress could decide not to move forward with some of these steps. Second, the timeline uh, for implementing some of these steps really varies. There are a lot of factors that could either make it happen quickly or make it take more time. On each slide, I've indicated kind of an estimated timeline. That's either the least amount of time something could take or the most time it could take. But even still, these are estimates. And there are a lot of factors that could influence um, how quickly something happens or how long it takes. So what's already been done? On his first day in office, President Biden signed an executive order that ended the so-called Muslim ban. How will this impact affirmative asylum seekers in New York City? In two ways. First, it means that uh, potential asylum seekers from countries that were affected by this ban um, may be more able to get visas to come to the United States now. Second, for those of you who have family um, in those countries that were impacted by the ban, it, it may be easier for them to get visas to come to the United States. So far, this is the only thing that's been you know, fully implemented. What hasn't been done, but could be done quickly? Um, these are many steps within the Department of Homeland Security or US, and Custom, US Customs and Immigration Services uses to address the backlog in affirmative asylum cases. Why, why could these things happen more quickly? It's because they depend only on administrative mechanisms within the Department of Homeland Security and within USIS. Um, so all, all that needs to happen is that the leadership of those two agencies need to decide to change their approach on something. Some examples include lifting the hiring freeze that's in place from the Trump administration, hiring new asylum officers um, who are specifically focused on uh, working through the backlog and affirmative cases, and third, reprioritizing how interviews are scheduled. Right now, we're still following the Trump administration's last in, first out scheduling priority. This means that applicants who submitted um, their application most recently are going to be the first, one interview, first ones to be interviewed. And then from there, the agency works backwards to people who submitted their application in 2017, 2016. Uh, the current administration could decide instead to interview those people from 2016 and 2017 first and then move forward to the most recent applicants. What's the timeline for these changes? We say at least two to three months. And why, why is that? It's because during transitions between administrations, uh, the new heads of agencies need to be confirmed first by the Senate, um, that they can, they can take on their job. Uh, Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, um, the Secretary of Department of Homeland Security, was just confirmed last week. Um, and from there, they begin their job and they have to hire their staff. Their staff needs to you know, go through clearances. They need to start their job. And then once everyone's kind of in position and started the job, they have to kind of do a survey of everything that was done in their agency or office by the previous administration. And that survey takes time. Once that, that survey is completed, then the leadership needs to decide, okay, what do we want to tackle first? What do we want to tackle second? This whole process typically takes a few months, the beginning of any presidential administration. So it's unlikely that we'll see big changes in DHS's approach to asylum for at least another two to three months. What hasn't been done, 
but would be a lengthier process to do. It would take more time. The key here is changing the work permit rules. And the reason is, if President Biden wants to reverse President Trump's work permit rules, he has to make a new regulation. And when you make a new regulation, it goes through what's called the rulemaking process. The rulemaking process uh, typically takes about a year. Um, we have a whole video that's focused on the kind of the steps of the rulemaking process. So if you're interested in understanding more about that, please watch that video. The link is in the description to this video. The other factor uh, to keep in mind when it, when it comes to the work permit rules is that we're still waiting on a court decision that could also block the work permit rules from being implemented. This is the same court decision that right now is temporarily allowing ASAP and CASA members to apply for their work permit at 150 days instead of 365 days, which is the new rule. Um, we're waiting for the court's final decision, which would apply to all asylum seekers. The timeline for this, we don't really know, but it's a factor for you to keep in mind. I've talked about things that DHS can do within the agency, changing the approach um, for hiring and scheduling, um, things that the president could do to make, you know, make new regulations that would overturn some of the uh, Trump administration rules. So what's in this immigration bill and, and why does Congress have to be involved? Um, the president has a lot of authority over immigration. It's vested in him by the constitution, but there are still some things that the president needs to go to Congress to approve. Uh, the three pieces of Biden's immigration bill that you know, potentially impact affirmative asylum seekers um, are a call for more resources to tackle the backlog. In US government, the uh, Congress controls the money. So if DHS or USIS don't have enough room in their current budget to, for example, hire more people, um, more asylum officers to work through the backlog, then they need to ask Congress for that extra money. And that's a piece of what's in this immigration bill. The second uh, piece that impacts affirmative asylum seekers is an elimination of the one-year filing deadline for asylum applicants. Finally, uh, the bill includes pathway to citizenship for, for many different groups of undocumented immigrants. It's not totally clear how this would apply to asylum speaker, seekers specifically, um, but, but depending on your specific case, uh, you know, certain protections might end up applying to you. However, none of these items are guaranteed to make it into a final version of an immigration bill or immigration bills that are passed through Congress. And each of these has its own challenges. Um, in the current Congress, there's, there's a group of uh, members of Congress who, who are really committed to reducing government spending. And so anything that involves more resources um, can be really tricky to pass and is usually subject to a lot of negotiation and ultimately compromise. It's hard to say what's gonna happen with the elimination of the one-year filing deadline for asylum applicants. Um, it could be um, leveraged as you know, an area for compromise. So if, if um, members of Congress wanna get another more controversial aspect of this bill passed, they might say, okay, we'll let go of this elimination and we'll get rid of that. Um, so it could be a bargaining chip. It's, it's hard to know. And then the pathway to citizenship is um, probably one of the most controversial or one of the, the areas where Republicans and Democrats disagree the most about how to approach immigration. And so we should expect to see some compromises and changes um, between what's written in President Biden's immigration bill and what makes it into final bills that become law. What's the timeline here? It's Again, it's really hard to say. Immigration is the third legislative priority for uh, the Biden administration. First, they wanna work on COVID-19 and then a big infrastructure bill to boost the economy. And then they'll throw their weight behind immigration. Um, so we're looking, you know, that, that's gonna take some time. But I can say that there's a cap. Um, every Congress lasts for two years. And at the end of that two year period, anything that hasn't been finished kind of gets archived. And the next Congress has to start over again. Um, so at most, this Congress has two years to pass this immigration bill. 
And realistically, because we're going to move into midterm elections, um, where the politics of things start to matter again more, um, they always matter, but they just get particularly intense during the midterm elections. Um, so really, it's about a year and a half before um, midterm elections take everyone's focus and it becomes harder to pass um, legislation around more, more partisan issues like immigration. On his last day um, in office, President Trump um, granted DED deferred and forced departure to Venezuelans. Um, there's nothing yet on USIS's website about DED for Venezuelans. So do not let anyone charge you for services related to DED. Um, if you have any questions about that, please contact us and we'll update you when there's more information about how that's gonna go into effect. The thing to note is that President Biden, or that um, uh, President Biden has put a pause on implementing a lot of President Tr those last things that President Trump tried to do, you know, in his last days and weeks in office after he had already been elected out. That's what we call a lame duck president, a president who was not reelected and he has, she has, you know, two or three months left in office and they'll often do a lot in those two or three months. President Biden has put a pause on all that being implemented because he wants time for his administration to review those things and say, do we really wanna move forward with this? Um, and so we may, we may see a delay in getting more information about DED for Venezuelans. Um, what about TPS? President Biden has been supportive of TPS for Venezuelans in the past. And there's a bill um, to grant TPS to Venezuelans that's already been introduced into Congress. So we may see more action on this front than we did in the previous administration. What's the timeline? At least two to three months. And that's again, because of this transition period where the new administration is kind of getting their feet, they're reviewing everything the Trump administration did and they're deciding what steps they wanna take next. I've talked a lot about what the executive branch, the president and the agencies can do, what Congress can do, but what about the third branch of government, the courts? Um, what could the courts do that would impact immigration reform? There are two things to be aware of. First, we're still waiting on the outcome of um, the, the court case about the work permit rules. So we'll have to keep an eye out for that. And then second, any new law or uh, you know regulation or law could be sued. Um, if a court decides to hear that case, um, the court can temporarily or permanently stop the regulation or the law from being implemented. So just because something passes Congress or um, President Biden signs an executive order or DHS makes a new regulation, doesn't mean that's where the process stops. There's still the judicial review that could, could change that rule or could get rid of it altogether. Um, the timeline on this it really varies. Um, you know, we saw President uh, Biden on his first or second day in office signed um, a halt on deportations for 100 days. And very quickly, a judge blocked that and said that the president didn't have the authority to do that. Um, and so these things can happen very quickly or they can take more time. Um, so what can you do? The, you know, our whole goal in creating this resource was to help you understand the processes right now that are at play. And then where can you have an influence? We're in this, this transformative period of transition between two administrations where people are you know, assuming their new jobs and are thinking, what do I wanna get done in the next four years? Um, and so there's an opening for, for the public to say these issues matter to us. Reef is working on a letter to Secretary Mayorkas and DHS generally um, about some of our priorities when it comes to making the affirmative process more fair. It touches on a lot of what I've discussed in this video. We're gonna share that with our community and you can sign on if you want to. So that's one thing you can do. Second, we encourage you to tell the organizations that you're connected to about the issues that matter most to you and see what they're doing to advocate for a more just asylum system and how you can help them. Use the organizations that have a bigger voice than you have as an individual um, to, to tell your priorities to the administration. Third, write to the Department of Homeland Security, USIS, the White House, 
Um, there are di different mechanisms to either submit comments, public, you know, or like public feedback, or write letters, or write emails to each of these uh, each of these organizations. If you'd like to do that, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. We can help you think about the the best place to give a piece of feedback. Um, and I know. You know, some of you are thinking like, you know, I'm still an asylum here. Some of you are potentially thinking I'm still an asylum seeker here. You know, I don't, I don't technically vote. Like what, what influence can I have? Um, and I'd say, you know, organize your community as well. Get other people to write in um, and, and share their perspective and advocate um, for these issues. Finally, write to your U.S. senators um, in New York, that's Chuck Schumer and Kristen Gillibrand. And to your representatives, um, you have a different de representative depending on where you live. You can find your representative in the link um, that I've put here, this URL. Write to them and say these issues matter to you. Why is this important? Because some immigration reform is going to happen within the executive branch. It's going to be the president and the agencies like DHS and USIS. But some of that immigration reform is going to happen in Congress too. And when those bills come up for debate, and members of com Congress are thinking about where to compromise to get something um, to get something passed so that it can become a law. It's important that they know what matters to you, um, so that they can decide what's non-negotiable. You know, I'm, you know, you could convince your senator or representative that they shouldn't take the one year, um, the elimination of the one year filing deadline off the table, or you could say, you know, nothing here addresses the work permits. Address the work permits, please. Um, so that's another avenue to make your voice heard. Finally, please stay connected with us. Um, you can check our asylum alerts on our website. Um, this is where we post kind of the most up-to-date information about changes to the asylum system. Um, we send those out uh, to our mailing list. So if you're not signed up to receive our emails, you can do so on the homepage of our website, which is listed in this URL right here. We also have um, weekly a weekly information hour. It's Wednesdays, 12 to 1 p.m. on Zoom. And you can just drop in. You don't need to make an appointment. It's open to anybody if you want to ask your questions. And members of the Reef team are in that meeting. And we can kind of hear your questions and answer them. We can talk about some of these topics that interest you. We can receive feedback um, if you'd like. The links to do all of this are on the home page of our website. Finally, if you have feedback about this resource, suggestions for other resources we could produce that would be helpful, please email me. My email is right here, um, and I'd love to hear from you guys. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.